uh, negotiations are uh, concerned. Uh, and now talking about uh, uh, bringing Africa together to be able to, to face or to engage properly and uh, positively with uh, international partners. We want to ask uh, this uh, question uh, on how, looking at how these, like you mentioned, Mr. Elijah Inrako, that the internal weaknesses are actually impeding Africans from excelling well. So now, looking at how we can uh, solidify uh, these weaknesses, the question directing, uh, I'm directing to you, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, is how can African uh, governments effectively navigate uh, and uh, leverage political or geopolitical interest uh, to maximize their economic potential? Number one, willingness. Willingness. And uh, for the sake of, of for the, uh, I mean, for fearing of uh, being repetitive even in here, uh, there are elements in uh, the previous, you know, uh, speaker, uh, brother Elijah's, you know, uh, uh, comments earlier that, you know, will speak into what you just said. But I believe that, you know, work, uh, Clarice, the first thing is willingness. Why do we say that? When you have uh, some head of states that are outspoken, that are clear, that are very brutal in the ways in which they address the current status of the relationship between the African countries and the Western world, or even the Eastern world with China or any other you know, partners, you do have others who are calling you know, for caution. We can take the example of the debate about the reform of the United Nations. When years ago, the powerful Egyptian uh, UN Secretary General, Boutros Boutros Ghali, who is accredited with the reform of the United Nations, you know, uh, a peacekeeping uh, a mission. When that debate came to the table about whether an African country should be given the seats at the Security Council to be making decisions that impacts world relations, you have dissensions about which one of the African countries should be at that table. We remember the competition, you know, where countries uh, such as Nigeria, South Africa, you know, were, were named in and there uh, as well. My point is there was no such a unity uh, in and there, no such a willingness and stronger power from uh, those uh, African heads of state to go there. And the lack of willingness, you know, uh, Clarice, also boils down to, again, the... Uh, uh, I mean, it's the reflection of the consequences of uh, this long-term relationship that, you know, uh, a geopolitical relationship that, you know, Africa has had. When you have a head of states, you have a politicians, you have a members of parliaments, you have a stakeholders in some countries that say, for instance, looking at France, that the relations between the France and Cote d'Ivoire, France and uh, Cameroon, or other countries are just relationship between them human beings and water. It means what it means. In other words, those people are saying that there is no way we can change or sever or move away from that relationship. But no way, nobody has ever called for a complete cessation, rupture of relationship with friends. We are talking about the reinvention the reaffirmation, the redimensionalization, whatever it is, of those relationships in such a way that it benefits, you know, Africa's economic growth. They said economic growth should be measured, not in terms of the GDP, because many countries today are fooling us, actually, with this question of GDPs. Number two, many governments in Africa today are fooling us, fooling their population with the so-called ranking sometimes that they come up with. The true question that we need to ask ourselves, and we are charging African citizens, workers, wherever you are, is to ask people to what extent the GDP that you are talking about this year is reflecting on my daily life, in my ability to have access to hospital, to have access to affordable, good quality health care to my ability to work and be paid, to have access to employment, or to have access to loans that will allow me to start a business, for instance, or you know, something in the informal sector. Let us know that the informal sector, the agricultural sector per se in Africa, does employ a lot more people than what we call you know, the formal sector. 
So you have that dimension uh, 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 in in there. Number one of uh, this uh, willingness. Number two, uh, Clarice. Internally, the earlier question that you asked, you know, what my brother Elijah was about, you know, what, how competitive politics impede Africa's, you know, uh, ability. It is true. We got to look at this. And this way, I'm just not talking about the uh, African leaders, but I'm talking about all stakeholders. When you look at uh, the uh, instability, chronic instability within our countries, as we talked about uh, two days ago or three, Niger went into another coup. And when you analyze, and if we sit down to analyze all of the intricacies or the intersections of this uh, new coup, you will see and understand that uh, to the table, there will be a question of security, number one, and, but there will also be the question of the redistribution of the revenues coming from the natural resources, uranium particularly, that is being exploited in and there. There is another level of the competition as well, is for the ability of these uh, head of states, the stakeholders, to really think about, think outside of the box and think about how to change. Again, we said the narrative of the relationship that they have with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the European countries. The uh, treaties that have been signed since the 1960s, the so-called years of independence, I uh, will charge our viewers and watchers with the power of the internet today to go do some research. And you will find how grotesque it was for friends, for instance, to say in some of these uh, defense and uh, uh, agreements, for instance, or development cooperation agreement, whatever you, 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 you term it, les accords de défense et de, 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 de coopération, you have uh, some uh, terms in those uh, treaties saying that natural resources that were discovered at the time of the signature and those that will be discovered in the future should be in the purview of France first before anything else. For some of the countries, since that we talk about you know, what currency, it is again the time maybe to blow the horn for many of those African countries that continue to use the French CFA to have a bold leadership that engage the topic on the table. Another thing that you know where African countries can do, as we talk about you know, we're harnessing the uh, human potential, there is no way people can continue to be outside of decision making. When it comes to elections, how many people do turn out to vote in respective countries, regardless of the effort that's being made? When it comes to participating, giving an opinion about you know, public service delivery, because that's how we can also measure economic development, how many citizens participate in those debates? I believe we will start doing that more and more, empowering the civil society, having more channels like African media, independence, that are listened to with some uh, different uh, uh, view and viewers, I believe that this will also put some sort of a pressure on the current leadership. There is uh, a very slow tectonic you know, change that you know, what we are witnessing with what is happening. New young leaders, they are not necessarily head of states, but wherever they are, we can see them voicing. When you have a young people in Niger, in many other countries, blocking UN, uh, United Nations, you know, peacekeeping troops. It is not because they don't want peace. It is not because they still wanted to have a chaos in their countries. It is a way for them to voice their discontent to the fact that years after years, you have those troops on the ground, but still there is no peace. And wherever there is no peace, there is no security. When there is no security, there is no uh, sound economic development and poverty continues. But in the meantime, what happens? You have uh, the development and the multiplication of uh, black market to continue to exploit uh, the natural resources. In Cote d'Ivoire, when the war started a few years ago, the cocoa beans were still growing and they were still harvested. At some point, we have even seen countries such as uh, Burkina Faso being able to export cocoa, but brother Elijah, there is no one cocoa plant in Burkina Faso. This is what comp uh, competition, internal competition or in-country competition can also uh, create as impediments for Africa to really 
take advantage of what is happening. Clarice, I want to rest on that case in here very quickly by mentioning one thing that you asked earlier. When we look at uh, the uh, competitive politics, Brother Elijah did answer the question looking at uh, internal conflicts. Liberia is there, Sierra Leone, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali. How even African countries play into that? My country, the Africans, for instance, you know what, in uh, popular language is accused, for instance, of a hosting at some point Charles Taylor in Cote d'Ivoire. And we know what Charles Taylor was doing in, uh, 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 in Liberia. But I want to mention another form of competition between the African countries themselves that also border around geopolitics. Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, the two countries, neighboring brothers, had to resolve to the United Nations to resolve a conflict over who possesses a what a uh, 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 oil, you know, uh, 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 resources uh, 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 onshore. Second, you have Nigeria and Cameroon. We remember in the 19, late 1980s, 1990s, about the Bakasi Island and then the fight that they have in there. What was the purpose of that? Geopolitical interest in there. Eritrea and Ethiopia, they fight in there. Geopolitical interest, who should have access to the sea? And uh, you have a uh, Morocco and Algeria over the question of uh, the uh, Sahrawi uh, Arab Republic. Till today, to what extent this is uh, preventing right? Northern Africa, for instance. And then you have also the exclusion of Mauritania or Mauritania deciding to leave the ECOWAS. Here are some uh, uh, forms of competitions as well, which I believe border around uh, the question of geopolitics. But again, at the end of uh, the uh, day, does not position Africa to be stronger. Last example I want to take is a company for which my father worked. It was a prime example, Air Africa. In 1967, I believe, Air Africa was created with a treaty that they called the Treaty of Yaoundé. 10 African countries came together, merged their forces to create this company, which was the largest, I mean, the company with the largest airspace in the world. Of course, we have a French interest in that. But later on, what did we find out? Air Africa has disappeared till today. To what extent? Country, internal conflicts, or in com uh, conflict between those uh, member countries in and there for leadership or for whatever it is, led to the dissolution of Air Africa and the inability to rebuild that company back. Where are we today? Our airspace is also broken apart. So these are some examples, again, that show the extent to which geopolitics, you know, what is playing and how, again, as African countries, we have not positioned ourselves to take advantage of all of those things for the sake of economic.